Hi, I'm Dr. Gemma, and welcome back to Cognitive, the Knitting Psychology Podcast. Cheerfully and somewhat irregularly in business since 2008. Segments today may include what's on my hooks, needles, and spindles, a strategy, something I really like, put a lid on it, oh shoot, and blather. So sit back, put your feet up, pick up your knitting, crocheting, spinning, weaving, or dyeing, (laughs) or any other yarny thing you're doing, and get ready to enjoy. Well, hi, I'm Dr. Gemma. Welcome to episode 99 of the newest series of Cognitive. Good heavens. It's been a pretty anticlimactic week after Tuesday, so I don't know how much I have to say, but I'm sure glad to be here and talk to you. I do want to thank everybody who has sent their best wishes for the hubs. He's doing well. We'll get to him. Thank you, Tiny Shiny Things. That was a very sweet comment. Thank you for sending the love. Which reminds me to say thank you to several of you, DC, Elaine, and Anne, and Karen. Uh, Thank you for sending all the love, for constantly sending the love. That also should include Jasmine and Gigi, by the way, although it's a little more off-the-record exchanges. Thank you. The ongoing love has really helped. Gigi, I am especially happy this week about your news, and I know that's over on your cast, so I won't steal your limelight, but really, really happy things are going well. COVID. I am so tired of talking about COVID, and I would really give this up, except I have patients now who have it. I have patients who have it very badly. Please go get your shots. That's all I'm saying. Don't make me beg. What's on my hooks and needles? I'd really like to finish something, anything. I'm ready to knit hats just to get an FO. However, since I didn't do any of that, I haven't done much of anything except the don't know yet. I am a little ahead on the squares, actually. I think I've got about four more squares than I should have right now. I am plowing through the black yarn. Wah! Yeah, I don't really like it. Knit Picks, Brava, Sport. Fine yarn. It's an acrylic, you know, it does its job. It's inexpensive, great for baby things. I do not make wool blankets because we do live in moth country. It would just be begging, you know, just begging moths to move into the farm again. And the last time I got moth vaded, which has now been quite a long time ago, I don't know, even may even have been about 10 years by now. At any rate, let me tell you, it took me like three years to get rid of the moth vaders. So, no. No wool anywhere moths can get it. So, you know, if you're going to do an acrylic yarn, this is a fine choice. I have to admit, when I look at that, you could just go over to Joann's and Michael's and find acrylics over there as well. You know, there's a lot of brands out there. I'll give Nitpicks a lot of credit for this. They have a wide, wide color range. That's the one thing they're really getting right with their workhorse yarns, as they do have excellent color ranges. Having said all that, October 25th will be 300 blocks day. Whee! (laughs) I haven't been doing anything else except I've been working on the second of my midsummer socks. I passed the heel today during a phone call, so I put in the waist yarn. And I'm working my way down the foot. I am loving these socks. I also did a quick survey of my scrap bin it does look like I might pull off some Franken socks after all. Let's see what happens, shall we? I really didn't give the Wrapped in Tiny Chains cardigan any love. It's such an easy pattern, and I suspect those of you who are serious crocheters out there could be whizzing through this. Everybody on Facebook seems to whiz through it, but me, no, dragging it out for months mainly because I'm just not giving it that much love because I'm embedded in a bunch of little projects. Ah, moving right along. In the show notes, you will see the top picture in the show notes, which can be found at cognitive, spelled cog, the word knit, I-V-E, cognitivepodcast.blogspot.com, or on our group on Ravelry, the top picture there is actually our summer vacation home of my youth, in a wonderful place called Kresgeville, Pennsylvania. 
They may have redrawn the city lines. I have a feeling it's actually slightly in a different town now, like Mechanicsville or something. I'm not even sure. But there it is, my childhood house. I found that photo while I was cleaning this week, and I scanned it and saved it immediately in my wild efforts to digitize my life. But it is also sitting over my desk. And I just thought I would share it. The funniest thing about it, you see that house, right? Four little bedrooms, little tiny house. Yep, eight of us in that baby. Things were different in the 60s. We, we lived closer to each other. I just want you to know what that picture is. In the meantime, what was I talking about? I was talking about there's also a picture of my second midsummer sock. And if you're really clever, you will notice I'm getting a pedicure. That's a little bit into the blather. But there is the second of the midsummer socks. Very, very handsome. I quite like them. All this to tell you that my favorite resources are listed. <laughs> Boy, did I go off track. Thank you for your patience. It's been a long week. My favorite resources are listed in the show notes at cognitivepodcast.blogspot.com and over on our group on Ravelry, where you are very welcome to read and comment, by the way. Dizzy Blondes, no love there. Let's get into a strategy. Well, this has something to do with my ASL class. One of the emotional management strategies that is not included by therapists and really should be. It doesn't show up in DBT in a precise form, although there are ways it's hinted at, I would say. That is your pets. Now, I have allergies, so I have sympathy for all of that, believe me. However, pets are a great long-term emotional management strategy. Now, this is a little problematic lately because people are doing emotional support animals and therapy animals, and there's a lot of abuses. And I'm going to tell you honestly, I get asked for, uh, shall we say, fraudulent letters all the time. So I have to grind my teeth as I say this. I am concerned we might have gone a little too far with the ESAs at times. However, I still am going to say, Pets are good for people. Pets are good for people the way nature is good for people. You have to get out into greenery. You have to walk barefoot in grass. You have to get fresh circulating air outdoors around you. You have to see the open sky, the trees, and the mountains. And animals are a part of all that. They are a reminder of that. But there's always research. Straight up, the research is that people who have pets live longer and are happier. People who have pets, their heartbeat will slow and their blood pressure will lower and their whole body will re-regulate while they pet their animals. This is why we keep them. I hate to be brutal, but this is why we keep them. Look, humans do all sorts of good things for themselves without realizing they're doing it. One of the great things you learn in my job is we do all these things. We do all sorts of mindful activities that extend our lives and get us in meditative states. We do all sorts of great things to help ourselves and pets are certainly on that list. So if nothing else, when you're petting your cat or you're petting your dog, you're regulating heartbeat and blood pressure and that's just really good for you. Long-term petting does seem to put us into a meditative state and yet there's more. The interesting thing about pets there's a lot of good anthropological information, too, around how we get pets, where they came from in human history. And I'm not going to go into all that, but I do want you to realize, too, I am on a farm as I record this. And there is another aspect to pets, and that is they help us. They just plain help us. If you have a house, you can put out mouse traps, but you know what the most effective mouse trap is? A cat. Why? Mice are quite intelligent. If mice smell a cat locally, if they smell it a lot, in other words, you don't just have a cat in your house for a weekend. They have a persistent sense of the smell of a cat in a location. Mice avoid it. I live on a farm. Let's face it. If my cat was to bring in every mouse that has ever crossed through this house, it would be a constant parade of little furry corpses. But the reality is she doesn't have to. Just by having a cat, you have a mouse deterrent. Pets are like that. Pets do a lot of good 
and pets came into the human world because they do a lot of good. Look, even something as humble as lab rats, people took them home as pets. But also here on the farm, we have three, count them, three working dogs. We have our dogs for defense. We also have our dogs for herding. All three of my dogs are working breeds. I'm really fond of that. Why? Well, that's why I believe in good dog breeding, that dogs that are bred for certain traits are incredibly useful to humans. And they're bred in a lot of ways that people don't realize. For example, the so-called lap dogs actually were bred to keep upper class women comfortable when they were menstruating. They were bred to be heating pads that sat in women's laps. That's what they're for. So, you know, there's a lot of really strange and esoteric uses of our pets going on out there. I'm avoiding all the kind of strange or sick ones. I don't mean to encourage that, but I mean, you have to realize that here in the 21st century in North America, especially, you know, we go to the pound and we just say, that looks like a nice dog and we pick it out. And that works great. But it has to be said, most of our house pets were bred with specific uses for humans in mind. Now, the interesting thing is where that has left the animal. There's a guy at the University of Budapest in Hungary who's taught dogs, he uses mutts, crossbred dogs, to ride an MRI sled. And so they now sit on this sled and they sit in his machine and he looks at their brains, activities, as he does certain things. He's learned this amazing amount of dogs in the last 10 years. What he's learned, among other things, is dogs prefer humans to other dogs. That when dogs see other dogs, you know, the pleasure parts of their brain light up. But when dogs see humans, they get ecstatically happy. Their brains light up wildly in all the pleasure centers. I don't think they've done as well with cats, but this guy is a genius. And I know there are some very good cat studies out there. The important thing is, yeah, we have changed animals to live with us they have changed. Now, of course, my favorite is that cats seem to have domesticated us, not the other way around. Cats are usually relatively quiet animals with each other, but they make a lot of noise in two situations, around their own young and around humans. There's a theory that the noises that cats make to humans are based on cats imitating the sound range of human babies. That's right. Your cat is trying to suck you in by pretending to be a baby. I don't know if that one's true, but I just love it. The important thing when I say this is that pets deserve our respect and our care, that we have molded them in many cases to be what they are, and they are trying to suit our needs. So if ever there was an argument for being humane and compassionate with animals, this has got to be it. But Whatever you're doing out there, whether you're allergic or you're not allergic, remember there are hypoallergenic pets, yes. There's no true hypoallergenic breed or species, although some claim to be among dogs and cats, but some come pretty close. At any rate, there is a pet for everyone if you want a pet. And people who have pets do better and are happier. So in the long run for emotional management, pets are really good for you. Is this going to make your apartment manager let you have a pet? Not necessarily, because they can be very damaging. But pets are good for us, and I hope if you love animals, you are able to have the pets you want to have. Certainly, my life has been wildly more rich because of my pets, and on several occasions, my dogs have actually saved and rescued me from attacks, generally while I was out running alone. Okie dokie. Fluffy books. I have to go catch up with She-Hulk as I record this. I am reading the series by Lynn Messina concerning the character Beatrice Hyde Clare. The first one is A Brazen Curiosity, and I have the link to that in the show notes. I think I was talking about these in episode 98. These are a lot of fun. They're popcorn. I don't even know which one I'm on. I think I'm on the third one. And you know where it's going, the hero and the heroine. You know they're eventually going to marry. They're just fun. What it really is, is this kind of unashamed 21st century mentality in the bodies of two people in an earlier age. 
And the great thing in the Regency, really. But the great thing is, the excuse for this is as follows. Our feckless heroine is not feckless. In the beginning of the book, the first book, she's very shy and withdrawn. She knows she's a permanent spinster. She's a dependent relative living with her aunt and uncle and cousin, cousins, plural. And she doesn't expect to ever change, except one day, one night, really, she walks into the library at a country house and finds a corpse and finds a duke standing over the corpse. And she eventually realizes this moment has completely changed her personality, that she's experienced real fear and kind of moved beyond it. This is not a deep psychological investigation, even though I just made it sound like one. What it is, is just a lot of good fun. So I do recommend the series. They are empty. I can't find any value to them. The author keeps shifting characteristics of different characters a little too much in the first two books because I think she's trying to find how much of a bully some of the relatives are going to be. But they're just a heck of a lot of fun. So this is the Beatrice Hyde Clare series by Lynn Messina. The first book is A Brazen Curiosity. Go enjoy it. Something I really like, why voting? I got my ballot. I love California because we have mail-in ballots and they really track those babies. You get an email that says your ballot has been sent to you. And then when you send it in, you get an email when they receive it. You get an email that says, let us know if you sent it and we didn't receive it. Let us know if we sent it and you didn't receive it. Voting. There's a lot of good voting to do in California. I'm in a congressional district where our representative is a complete and utter jerk. So voting, you bet it's something I really like. Get online, read all the issues, read all the paperwork, do a good job. I also happen to like reflexology. I have not had good reflexology probably in like three years, but that all changed this week. The interesting thing about it is reflexology works from the theory that all your nerve endings in your whole body somehow play into the palms of your hands and also the insides of your ears and also the soles of your feet. So if somebody massages these well, your whole body gets a good nerve massage. Finding someone who does good reflexology is a real gift. We happen to have one of those here in the Santa Clarita Valley, somewhere near where I live. The interesting thing about it is there are a lot of these places where you go in, you pay them a really small amount, and they will do an hour of working on your feet. They will soak your feet in hot bubbly water while they massage you through your clothes. Not a particularly hard or thorough massage, but it feels great. And then when they feel your feet have soaked enough, they lift them out of the water, gently towel dry them, and then they massage them. And the interesting thing was I was so rigid and I got this massage therapist who went crazy on me. I really didn't expect it. She took one look at me and she went full bore, really hard massage. That's highly unusual in a reflexology massage. She was good on my feet, but she was digging in with elbows on my back because I was so rigid. The interesting thing about this is, of course, it was kind of a Swedish massage through my clothes, except for the footwork. And it really didn't do a lot for me because I'm so rigid, but it felt great. It hurt so good. However, what the reflexology does is encourages everything to relax later in the day. So there I was walking out thinking, I'm going to be bruised, and I didn't get much relaxation out of that, but I'm glad I had it done. And yeah, like six hours later, everything relaxed, and the next day, by golly, I was a little bruised down my back. Usually they don't do it that hard. But I want you to know about reflexology because it's one of these inexpensive pleasures that is just a great relief, and you should consider getting it done every so often if you can. I got it done this week, which was great because I had a midterm coming up in ASL, and this is all a story unto itself. Put a lid on it. Well, I have figured out that I'm just not cooking. I have not been cooking for three weeks. I noticed it this week when I realized I do dishes once every two days. Not because I'm letting them pile up, because I don't have any. And I also realized that one of the things I wanted to try 
were keto milkshakes. And I mentioned this before, I tried keto chow. Now, keto chow comes in individual packages shake by shake or comes in a lump pack with strangely 21 servings in it. Since I don't want to throw 21 wrappers into a landfill, I'm going for the bulk pack. The problem is when you get the bulk pack, of course, it's only one flavor, so you get 21 straight milkshakes of a flavor that I hope you like. So far, so good. Some of the flavors are better than others. I end up getting the bulk pack of the mocha and I'm quite enjoying it. Now, some things you should know. As I have said in a previous episode, I don't think anything that comes in a powdered format like this is truly keto. I think one of the ideas of keto is to eat real food, including food with fats in it. Second, these things are probably costing you close to five bucks a shake. So this is no bargain. However, it's not a bad deal when you're all by yourself and you don't feel like cooking, I have to say. Third, do not order it from the Keto Chow website. Do not. I have a link to that website so you can see all the flavors and you can get their starter kit with their special shaker, mixer, blender, cuppy thing. That's great, but do not order from them. Why? I ordered one of the variety packs. I figure I'll get one 21 flavor variety pack so I can try a whole bunch of different flavors, then I'll order them in bulk. It did not come, and their customer service has been dreadful, with a capital D. So I'm telling you right now, do not order from the Keto Chow website. But if you want to try it, you can order it on Amazon, and you can get the special mixy blender cuppy thing package that has five different flavors, so that's good. But do not order it from Keto Chow. Amazingly bad customer service. One of my packages has been lost in the mail now for 20 days and all I heard from them was, hey, we filed a lost mail complaint with the post office and that's it. No refund, no nothing. Don't order from them. But they're on Amazon and Amazon is pretty good when they lose your packages. Do I think this is a healthy thing? Not especially. I think it's a kind of get by thing until the boys are home. Which leads me to the blather. Well, ASL, we're on week eight. Oy vey, we're talking about families. How many people are in your family? Yeah, so they teach you how to say three people, four people. They weren't ready for 10 people. <laughs> Particularly when there are three sets of twins in the 10 people. So I'm trying to do the video. We record videos for our teacher to see how we're doing. I'm trying to record the video where she says, how many siblings do you have? Where are you? Do you like your siblings? Are you close to your siblings? <laughs> what do you have in common with them? What are you different than them with respect to, right? This is a nightmare. <laughs> but anyway, I'm getting through it. We had our midterm this week. You know, when it rains, it pours. I got through the midterm just fine. But I have to say, the beloved Hubs is involved in this story. He has been holding up amazingly. He has been through so much since the beginning of this year. First of all, in, I think it was in January and March, he had his cataract surgeries, one per eye. That was tough enough because things were still very quarantined at the time. And then his left eye started falling apart. And he had to go in and get it staple gunned with lasers to keep the retina together. And then he gets over that and everything is good. And then his right eye starts doing this, and this was the big time. He got a huge retinal tear, and then his retina disconnected. He finally got the major surgery on that eye. Okay, so this guy, I mean, post-traumatic stress hardly begins to describe what this poor guy has been through. Well, this week, he finally just went gaga. He called me Tuesday morning in hysterics. Fortunately, I did not pick up the phone. I think I was asleep, and that was good. Because an hour later, I realized he had called me in hysterics. And I called him back, and we sorted it out. And it was. He was getting flashes of white blindness in his right eye. Now, I don't know about you, but that's going to freak me out. At any rate, he called his doctor. Doctor saw him right away. It was actually a fairly simple fix. They upped the prednisolone, the steroid that he was putting on his eyeball in drop form. And it reduced the pressure in his eye. But the poor guy. I mean, the poor guy 
just totally freaked out. So, you know, when I got him calm and everything was worked out, I looked at my clock and it was 30 minutes to my first patient. And I said, I have a midterm tomorrow and I am a nervous wreck and I can't do it anymore because Monday night I had a class. Tuesday I had the hysterical husband. I was like, I can't do it. I can't even talk to patients. I hate everybody. So I took Tuesday off and I took the beloved hubs out for an early lunch just to make sure he was okay. So I went down to where he was staying and we met for lunch and he was doing okay. And then I said, I hate the world still, but I'm in this great strip mall that has a super cuts and has a reflexology place and has a nail place. I hit them all. I ended up with a haircut. I, I actually it was really pretty shocking. I went in and as I do, I said, please cut it. So it's just below my shoulders as they always do. They cut it too short. I actually like it this time. It really just curls up at the ends because I do have thick curly hair. So it's really just resting on my shoulders and I'm enjoying it. What I didn't realize, I have hugely thick hair even at 62, but most of it is now coming out of the dead center back of my head and falling down the middle. What this means is as my hair gets longer, it gets wider and heavier and thicker. So when they cut it, they cut a disproportionate amount because they took out most of that thick part. So suddenly my head is light. Yes, I said it, I'm lightheaded, but it feels wonderful. It feels wonderful. And after the haircut, I mean, it was great. I walked into the massage place and they said, you're next. And I said, great. So I got the reflexology massage and the woman went to town on my back. And then I checked the nail place and said, no, went to another place. They said, yes. I got a boffo pedicure with my favorite color. The color is called I'm Not Really a Waitress. I am told, can't think who told me this. Was it DeCeline Nitz? Anyway, I am told there is another color in the same line called I'm Really an Actress. It's I'm Not Really a Waitress with glitter in it. I love nail polish. I really do. And frankly, I also spent time just lying in bed that day. I just laid down and stared at the ceiling and said, I have got to calm down. So Tuesday was a great day and we were all okay. And at the end of it, I just took myself home and I studied for my midterm, feeling much better about the world. So that leads us to the calendar. Stitches, Southern California, November 11th through the 13th. I will be there at least the 13th. If you want to meet up there, I would love to. Gins, this certainly means you, but anybody else within the sound of my voice, if you want to meet up at Stitches Southwest, I will at least be there on Sunday the 13th. I am staying at the Sheraton attached to the convention center that night. So I will be there the 13th into the 14th at a minimum. We are on for the Grand Canyon, June 5th through 9th, 2023. And I hope I am on, not sure yet, for Sunnybank, August 17th to 21st, 2023. Interesting reality, dear friend is moving to New Brunswick. So I will probably go stay with her and visit Sunnybank for one or two days. So I may be just in New Jersey at that time. If you want to meet up, let me know. Minerva gets the last word. There is a picture of Minerva in my lap with her head rolled back and her eyes in slits, enjoying her chin scritches. Why is Minerva looking so happy? because this week I actually used her as a strategy. And I'm going to say it, of all the animals getting through these three weeks without the boys, Minerva has been the one who has kept my sanity. She brought me a little Princess Leia Lego minifigure. Today she brought me a Republican, I think, guard. No, an alliance, a rebel, a rebel guard. That's when I realized she's not giving these to me as gifts. She's trying to get me to throw them for her as a toy. I'm not the brightest human, but I'm deeply, deeply grateful to Minerva. She has kept me going. By the way, the thing I haven't said, uh, we are expecting at this point the boys to come home this coming Tuesday, which, what is that? The 11th? So they will be home soon. Okay, everybody, that's the last word from Minerva and from me. I know it's a short episode. Just be grateful. I can't believe I've recorded through this last month. It's been pretty wild. I'm so grateful for you all, though. I really appreciate your help. Everybody remember, 
get your shots, wash your hands, socially distance, wear your mask in a crowd. Most of all, everybody stay safe, take care of each other, and I will talk to you soon. Bye-bye. So we have come to the end of another episode of Cognitive. Please do not use this podcast to diagnose yourself. If you think you are having a mental health problem, please contact a licensed mental health professional. Show notes for these episodes can be found at cognitivepodcast, all one word, dot blogspot.com. Episodes can be found at iTunes under the name Cognitive Podcast, but also can be found posted next to the show notes on the Blogspot page. Thank you so much for listening. Everybody stay safe, take care of each other, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.